Good morning, friends, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our exploration of the 2,000-year-old Catholic intellectual tradition. My name is Dr. Benjamin Smith, and this week I'm joined by no one. My colleagues are fully engaged and occupied with other matters, so for better or worse, uh, this morning you are stuck just with me. Uh, but that's going to give me the opportunity to talk about something that I think is, that I know is near and dear uh, to my own heart, and that is... Um, the idea that philosophy, um, informed, of course, by Christian faith, but the philosophy can provide us with uh, insights, uh, with principles um, for practical living. And what I want to do today is share with you a little bit of the principles and ideas that have shaped my life on a sort of practical and existential level, maybe even an emotional level. Um, sometimes we think about philosophy um, only as a matter of academic inquiry, and certainly there's a lot to be said for, uh, I think, the academic side of philosophy for uh, philosophical research. But it's also the case that from its very beginning, philosophy was engaged with life. That when you look at Socrates as sort of the paradigm of the philosopher, um, he's a man of the everyday, although he was an extraordinary man. Uh, he, he took philosophy sort of out of the clouds and brought it into the marketplace, as many scholars uh, will say. He brought it down to earth and, and wanted to use philosophy as a tool, as an instrument, to examine how we should live and how we should examine ourselves, how we should think about our relationships, our feelings, um, and the decisions that we make. And so I think that that one of the real values of philosophy, and maybe one of the reasons that philosophy has fallen into some dis, um, you know, has, has acquired maybe a, a bad reputation or a reputation is useless, is because we've left this aspect of philosophy, uh, I think really since the Enlightenment, um, underdeveloped, right? That is the practical daily use of philosophy. Really thinking about philosophy as a way of life. It's interesting, this is the perspective that St. Augustine has when he says of philosophy, that philosophy, uh, that the true philosophy is Christianity. Uh, within the Augustinian perspective, that makes sense because what he's saying is, well, philosophy is a way of life. It's a, it's a way of life oriented towards wisdom. Um, and if that's so, right, well, then Christ is the highest wisdom and therefore Christianity is the highest form of philosophy. Well, there's much more, of course, to be said on that topic. But I just bring up St. Augustine as someone who recognizes a Christian, of course, one of the preeminent uh, Christian theologians, uh, who recognized the importance of and the reality of philosophy as a way of life. So when you think about philosophy as a way of life, then you think, well, okay, philosophy is the love of wisdom. It involves the pursuit of wisdom, dwelling with wisdom, being a friend with wisdom, wanting to possess wisdom, wanting to, to change your life in accordance with wisdom. You think about, you know, when we really love someone, right, we're willing to change our lives. We, we make decisions that affect everything about us, right? And so if we're true lovers of philosophy, uh, sorry, true lovers of wisdom, Sophia, then uh, we will change our lives, right? We will adjust ourselves um, to the wisdom that we have uh, received. Now, and the principles that I have used here and developed uh, for my own sort of kind of personal principles of, of uh, life philosophy, uh, the, uh, I've drawn these from a variety of, of places, uh, especially uh, from the Christian spiritual tradition, authors like C.S. Lewis, um, Augustine, St. Jose Maria Escrivá, uh, thinkers of that sort, uh, writers uh, working within the Christian intellectual tradition but also especially from uh, the Stoics. Um, now, I could do a whole podcast, and I probably will here in the near future, on Stoicism. But Stoicism often gets a bad rap, and I think sort of undeservedly so among Christians. Uh, Stoicism, of course, is not perfect. Uh, it has errors within it, especially in its earliest forms. The, fo the kind of Stoicism that I find most useful and attractive uh, is the kind of later Stoicism of uh, the Romans, the Stoicism espoused by uh, especially by Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius. Of course, Epictetus himself was Greek, but he worked within the Roman uh, milieu. Uh, Stoicism, 
um, like other forms of classical philosophy, let's say, has errors within it, but still may, may be used by the Christian. Um, in doing so, we follow uh, you know, the path well marked out for us by St. Augustine, that we may, um, if we like, um, um, you know, pillage the treasures of the ancient world. You know, where we find in Stoicism or Aristotelianism or Platonism something useful to the Christian, something valuable and edifying to the Christian, we may take that up and use it, of course, uh, with you know, due care to not incorporate any of the errors that go along with it. And I think the same can be said of uh, Stoicism. That is, again, although Stoicism has its erroneous points, uh, Stoicism has also, I think, really deep insights. Um, so those are the two sources from which I, I've drawn my own sort of principles for life. Again, the spirit, the Christian spiritual tradition, um, and, and I take that in a fairly ecumenical way to include C.S. Lewis, um, but then also uh, from from Stoicism. These are principles that I have found to be useful for my, for, to me in working through various, um, to be frank, disappointments, um, things that have um, gone sideways in my own life, um, ways in which um, I have failed or um, others have failed me or um, circumstances have conspired, <laughs> right, uh, to deprive me of something that I wanted to achieve or deprive me of some good that I had possessed. Um, or also principles that, you know, just help me in my day-to-day -day interactions with others and my day-to-day -day, uh, work, even at a professional level. Uh, so when I say these principles are practical, I really mean it, as in they're principles that, that I call to mind on a regular basis each day. Um, now, I would certainly want to discourage uh, anyone from a kind of moribund introspection. That is, we need to not be obsessed with our own sort of states of mind or our own egos or psychology. That's probably one of the sort of the problems that we encounter often in, um, I think, our modern way of, of thinking and our modern form of experience. Uh, nevertheless, a certain amount of uh, reflection um, is important, a certain amount of interior cultivation or the cultivation of a healthy interior life. Uh, we have an interior life, whether we like it or not, right? Um, the great uh, Catholic writer, uh, Gary Lagrange, um, talks about the idea that the interior life is that conversation that we carry on within ourselves and that we don't necessarily share with others or we may share with others, but that we all have it, right? Now, in our, this time of great distraction, right, we might have it less but it's still there. And even though, you know, we may neglect that interior life, that interior dialogue we have with ourselves, it happens if we fail to feed it with things that are nutritious, things that are deep, things that are wise, then really our interior life just, you know, um, diminishes and declines. It's still there though, <laughs> right? It just can become very unhealthy. Uh, a healthy interior life is fed by important truth, by principles that are readily applicable to our lives, uh, principles that are rooted in uh, wisdom and in the insights of those who are, are wiser than ourselves. And so I offer these principles to you, uh, not because they're my own uh, necessarily, or because uh, um, I possess any particular wisdom about them, but because they are in fact, um, I've found them to be useful to me uh, and because they come from uh, those who are wiser uh, than myself. So uh, that's my way of preface. So I'm going to just state these five principles that I return to on a regular basis, as I say. Uh, and, um, and then I'm going to kind of go through and, and, and talk about them uh, um, with you. So here are the five principles that I've found useful. Uh, first, do not react. Second, do not judge. Third, attend to yourself. Fourth, attend to the present. Fifth, accept all from God. I'll go through those again. First, do not react. Second, do not judge. 
Third, attend to yourself. Fourth, attend to the present. Fifth, accept all from God. Okay, so there's probably a lot of qualifications <laughs> that I need to introduce here and, and comments uh, by way of application. First, um, the first two principles are very closely aligned. That is, um, do not react and uh, do not judge. Now, I, I would want to say with both of these principles um, that there's a kind of unspoken qualification. And that is, um, do not react except when necessary. And do not judge except when necessary. So um, you might feel like that takes away a lot of the power of those principles, but I, I found that it hasn't. Um, so let's think about our reactions and our judgments. Reactions here, in particular, I mean our emotional reactions to the various circumstances of our lives, our emotional reactions to other people, uh, especially when those emotional reactions tend towards, um, we'll say, uh, anger or hatred. Um, what we should recognize, right, um, I think, is that we're flawed, right? Um, just as a philosopher, I can recognize that most human beings are either bad or mediocre, um, myself included. And so I should recognize that my emotions, my emotional reactions, uh, are often going to be flawed, right? I, like a lot of people, have my strengths and weaknesses, but over the years, in various ways, uh, I've developed certain emotional habits, and, and everyone uh, does this. Um, and those emotional habits um, might actually fit or correspond to the situation or to the person I'm reacting to, but they very well might not. They might just be more about me and the way I react to things. Uh, I can give a very good example of this is I have a real antipathy towards sudden noises or frenetic sounds. Um, and so there are times when uh, my beloved children get on my nerves uh, a great deal and I become very angry uh, sometimes, but then I have to step back and say, okay, they're not actually doing anything wrong. They're just being kids. Kids are noisy <laughs> and um and and I need and my emotions are just sort of out of whack compared to the real circumstances here, right? Again, they're not actually doing anything wrong. They're just being kids, right? I have a particular um, uh, dislike for uh, excessive uh, or frenetic noises. Uh, so that that that's what I mean by not reacting, right? Um, also, we should recognize that other people are flawed. And that we have no idea, usually, or very little idea, what other people are going through in their behavior, right? We very often, so often, jump to conclusions about um, what people are thinking and the judgments that motivate their uh, behaviors. So I think there, what we want to do is uh, we want to just back off, right? Uh, we, we don't know what other people are going through. Uh, we don't know their emotional backgrounds, their history. Uh, and so we need to um, check at least our emotions, uh, our emotional reactions. Again, especially when they involve uh, anger and hatred. Now, in saying that, I, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. I don't think that anger is intrinsically evil. Uh, the problem is that our anger very often, though, is based on poor judgments or our anger can very easily... Um, become disproportionate, right? Uh, so St. Thomas, you know, when he talks about anger, says that anger is uh, can sometimes be just. There are times when it's right to be angry. Right? Um, but he also notes that often our anger is based on unjust uh, judgments and then also on, um, um, also that also our anger often goes too far. Uh, of course, we could also not just say anger, but also desire, right? Uh, you know, this is on, uh, on the other end of the spectrum, right? It's our, our, our desires for things, our passions for things can sometimes be solicited um, in ways that, that don't call in our higher judgment or our moral conscience, right? So certainly, you know, our lust, um, you know, sexual lust can be excited in this way, uh, or the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Right, the desire for 
grandiose houses and all that sort of thing these are all things that can be solicited by marketing techniques and so forth that don't appeal again to our higher reason and to our moral conscience and when we have experiencing those reactions we need to step back for a second say well why am I so fascinated and desirous of having these kinds of clothes why is it so important for me to have just the right backsplash in my kitchen it's really not in fact it might just be a distraction from things that are better and more important so again when I say do not react what I mean is let's not react excessively let's not react disproportionately right for myself I think when I find myself with a strong emotion this principle causes me to ask why do I have with a strong emotion is this strong emotion really healthy is this strong emotion going to make my life better is it going to make my life more virtuous is it contrary to my duty is it pious those sorts of things by that time right once you've completed that exercise then you will no longer just be reacting see the see the point there right so if you examine your feelings and you find that your feeling is in fact acceptable you've moved beyond the place of mere reaction you move to the place of a considered and mature kind of reaction rather than a flippant uh, or reckless reaction so that's what I mean by do not react second do not judge this is very similar so I won't spend as much time talking about this one but you know we go around with a lot of opinions I think that we don't really need to have right? sometimes I want to say that really it would just be helpful for us to just shut up more um, there are so many things that people have passionate opinions about that they, that either have nothing to do with the fulfillment of their ordinary duties uh, or uh, that they can't have any impact on or that they have no expertise in right? um, and so I think that we would be much better off not um, uh, entertaining such judgments excessively of course there's nothing wrong with a certain amount of leisurely engagement with a broad range of questions and patterns of thinking but in our day-to-day -day lives right um, uh, there are things that I need to form judgments about but there are also things that I don't need to form judgments about one of my favorite distinctions in philosophy is the uh, distinction that Epictetus makes uh, between those things that I can control and those things that I cannot control I'd say a similar uh, sort of distinction uh, is between um, judgments that I need to make and judgments that I don't need to make there are matters about which I don't need to make a judgment uh, why because they're not relevant to my duty they're not they don't belong to my expertise uh, or they're not something that I can impact or that again needless judgments include judgments about things that are not relevant to my duty that um, uh, 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 don't belong to my expertise or that uh, I cannot uh, they're about a matter that I cannot impact in any way um, so those sorts of judgments I'm not saying that they're evil I'm just saying that they can be a real distraction and that when they become a problem that is when they distract me from what is my duty when they distract me from uh, my growth and virtue or my spiritual life uh, then I need to I need to stop it right that's just, just what I need to just stop right and move on you know take that judgment and, and set it aside and move on to things that are actually helpful and that are actually useful um, you know having allowing your your mind to be absorbed in your coworkers silly opinion about X right oh Danny believes X about this and that's not that a stupid idea why could he believe that blah 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 right when really Danny's opinion about this has no relevance to my duty and it doesn't his opinion about it about whatever we're talking about is not an area of my expertise and it's nothing about it's about something that I can't really change or impact well perhaps I should just set that aside especially if it becomes a trouble to me so judgments that are unnecessary that are troublesome that are distracting um, that um, you know direct us away from our duty 
those are things that we can just we should just set them aside right we don't need to have an opinion about everything believe it or not the third uh, principle here so those are kind of like I would say house cleaning right the, those first two principles get rid of unnecessary uh, emotional reactions get rid of unnecessary judgments that doesn't mean that judgments are bad it doesn't mean emotions are bad both of them i think are part of a good life just let's get rid of the ones that are uh useless uh unnecessary um and unhelpful the third one uh principle here is attend to yourself uh this is not a this is not a principle about um selfishness uh this is a principle about attending to your own duty rather than the failures of others so we can spend a lot of time, and it's sort of entertaining, to um, uh, thinking about the ways in which others fail to do their duty. And oftentimes, or, you know, th those considerations, those criticisms might even be just, right? It might even be the case that you're correct about your Aunt Sally's uh, deficiencies or your co-worker's deficiencies. The ways in which maybe your employer has uh, is not fulfilling his duties. Uh, and and within a certain space, that might be important to, to think about and to know, especially if it's relevant to your own duty and authority. For example, if you are a father, it is relevant for you to be aware of, uh, say, the ways in which maybe your sons um, have done poorly, right? Mainly so that you can correct them, right? Uh, and help them and give them better instruction. But there, your own do, it's your own duty to address right, someone else's failures, someone else's deficiencies. Um, so there are times where we do need to think about that. But there, you're really still doing your own duty, right? You're fulfilling your duty as a father uh, to guide your sons. The, um, uh, a lot of times, though, we have negative opinions uh, about the way in which people have failed that really aren't relevant, right? And really aren't, uh, belong, don't really belong to our duty. Um, again, you might say, let's talk about the way in which various political leaders fail, uh, their various deficiencies, their lack of adherence to duty. Well, as a citizen within a democracy or within a republic, because the United States of America is a federal constitutional republic, um, it is part of my duty to be aware of the, the, the character and efficacy and wisdom of our uh, political leaders. But only in so much as it's my duty. At a certain point, you know, um, mocking the stupidity of various, you know, progressive politicians goes beyond probably what's necessary, right, as a citizen. And uh, while it may be good fun, it's not necessarily good ethics, right, <laughs> or uh, um, uh, a good way to live, uh, a good way to make our decisions. So on this third point, what we should be attending to is our own duties, right? What what is What duty do I need to fulfill now? Uh, what are the duties of my state in life? Uh, how do I fulfill those obligations and responsibilities that the Lord has placed uh, before me? Uh, that God and his divine providence has made me a father, has made me someone who likes philosophy and has some skill in it. Um, he's made me an employee, uh, an administrator within a particular um, uh, institution. Uh, within those parameters, those are my, my duties, right? Uh, I have other relationships that help me to understand my duties. Uh, Epictetus, I think, is quite good on this. He talks about the the way in which the the divine providence has placed certain relationships within my life, and um, uh, those relationships help me to understand what uh, understand my duty, my obligations, my obligations as a father, uh, as a citizen, as an employee, uh, etc. So stop being distracted by the failures of others, by the responsibilities of others, and rather attend to your own. Right. Uh, this is actually found also in the writings of uh, St. Basil, right? That is, uh, attend to yourself, attend to your own duty, rather than thinking about how others fail to do their duties, their, uh, their, um, how they fail to, to perform their obligations. A fourth principle here uh, that is uh, um, 
useful is attend to the present so attend to yourself and attend to the present uh, c.s lewis talks about this quite a bit that that duty is always in the present right um, the past is not something we can do very much about um, the future we can do a little bit about but not a lot um, if you actually look at the gigantic picture of the world and history and the way things actually work uh, and so what we can affect, though, and where our real duties lie, right? this is C.S. Lewis's point, is always in the present. Uh, the one exception to this that C.S. Lewis points out is the idea that um, uh, some, sometimes our duty is to be planning for the future. And when that occurs, then do it. Okay, But most of the time, we spend a great deal of time in anxiety about the future, worried about the future, plotting about the future, having future desires and aspirations that are either excessive or needless um, or overwrought. Sometimes, again, it's our when it's our duty to think about the future, right? Like how I'm going to pay my bills next week, those sorts of things. Then, of course, then then that's when you should do your, uh, you should do that, right? You should be thinking about the future then. But for the most part, our duties are at the present, right? Well, even, even the duty to think about the future sometimes is a duty that happens in the present, right? And so what we need to do is attend to the present. If we're going to fulfill our obligations and our responsibilities, we need to be focused not on regrets about yesterday, nor about uh, anxieties about the future, but about the duties that present themselves to us immediately within our daily lives, right? Our duty to get up on time, our duty to... Um, to uh, balance the checkbook, uh, our duty to uh, engage in prayer in a serious way, our duty to uh, prepare um, uh, food for our family, our duty to arrive at work on time, our duty at work when we're at work to fulfill our contractual obligations, uh, etc. Right? These are all things that occur within the present, and it's uh, I think a great deal of relief when. It great, leads to a great deal of relief and peace and feelings of effectiveness when we focus on those things, right? Again, not anxiety about the future, not regret about the past, but focusing on the present, right? Focusing on the present duty. Uh, in addition to thinking about the present duty, right, um, or obligation, we also can think about, you know, sort of the, the, you know, the present pleasure or good. Now, again, I don't think, you know, we should only live for today or anything like that. Uh, we do need to think about, to some degree, the consequences of our actions. But sometimes, you know, we take that too far and we don't just enjoy the beauty or the goodness that is right in front of us. Um, this might sound a little Pollyannish, uh, but I think it's true that we, will, we allow a good deal of pleasure and uh, of, of innocent pleasure uh, and of goodness and beauty to slip by, right? Because we don't attend to that present good. You know, if, if we're always plotting about tomorrow, we might not enjoy just having a good silly laugh with our children in the present, right? There's a kind of goodness and innocent pleasure there that um, that is right in front of us, right? And if we're attending to the present, we can just sort of enjoy it for its own sake without necessarily having to worry about, well, how, you know, <laughs> getting the kids into the best college or, or, or retirement or, or things of that nature. So again, attending to the present relieves us of, of uh, sometimes the guilt we struggle with from the past, the anxiety that we might have about the future. Uh, it helps us to attend better to our duties uh, and to more appreciate those good and beautiful things that we find uh, in our lives. Last point here. Um, uh, the last principle here is to accept all from God. Uh, so, or, you know, accepting all from God, um, I think that this is a practical application of the truth of divine providence. Divine providence, right, is the view that history is not an accident. It's the view that God has a plan and that that plan is effectual and real and present in our lives. Um, the way St. Thomas Aquinas talks about this 
is to talk about it in terms of the plan for the universe in the mind of God. God is provident in the sense that he has prepared not just the ends, but also the means by which those ends are to be accomplished. God would be a poor father, a poor ruler, if he failed to do so. And so God is not a poor father. He is not a poor ruler. Um, in fact, he is um, wise, right? infinitely so, um, transcendently so, uh, I should say. Uh, and so he has prepared not only uh, the, the rules for the universe, not only the ends, not only the general ends, but the particular ends, not only the general means, but also the particular means. Uh, and God's plan is as effectual as is his causality. Well, friends, his causality ex uh, extends to everything. Right? God is the first cause of every effect. God is the first cause of every change. God is the first cause of every motion or coming to be or ceasing to be, right? God is the first cause of every change. Now, he's not the only cause. <laughs> that is, there are secondary causes, and those secondary causes are real causes. But God is the first cause of everything. That's not my opinion. That is the philosophically demonstrated thesis of Thomas Aquinas. It's also what's taught very clearly, right, in the Catechism of the Council of Trent. So we can take that as a starting point. Uh, it's also uh, something that the Stoics recognized, right? That is that that the wise God, sometimes referred to as Logos, right, who rules over all things, who's the principle of order truly rules over all things so that there's a, a wise and provident plan that pervades change in history and pervades even my own life down to um, my personal life, my family life, my romantic life, my professional life, etc. All of those things right, uh, are things that are subject to divine providence. Nothing escapes divine providence because Nothing escapes first causality of God. Now, there's a lot of speculative questions <laughs> that that raises. Questions about human freedom, about causality, etc. And I don't want to explore those right now. I will be exploring those in a future podcast, especially once we move into talking about the philosophy of God. Um, but rather right now, what I want to do is, is focus on, on the practical side of that. Uh, and the practical side of that is this principle that I've been talking about, which is to accept all from God. Um, if I remember correctly, and, and forgive me if I uh, state the author's name incorrectly, um, I think the author's name is De Cassade, uh, but he wrote a book named um, uh, Abandonment to Divine Providence that I had the blessing to read uh, many years ago and profoundly impacted the way I thought about this. But we really do, as Christians, and I think even just as wise philosophers, need to learn to accept all from God. I think divine, the doctrine of divine providence is um, supported by faith and by right reason. Uh, and so that, uh, and as such then, we should accept that everything in our lives, for good or ill, both the blessings and the disappointments are part of God's good and wise plan. That's, that's, that's tough to accept. And I don't say it lightly. To say I've been through my own set of disappointments, certainly um, not greater than the, by any stretch than the, uh, I'll put it this way, many people have had many more disappointments than I have. Um, and of a much graver sort. Um, but I do know something of what I speak here, and, and accepting that doctrine, right, that everything is part, uh, everything that happens to us, even the mistakes we make, are part of God's good and wise plan. That kind of, it has 
that principle has a, the potential to be very fruitful when things are worse or at their worst. By saying that it's very fruitful, I don't mean that it takes away the pain. I don't think it does. But it it gives you the confidence that there is some intelligibility about it. It gives you the confidence that um, that there is some good that the Lord is working out through that disappointment, through that evil. And it should give us uh, peace about the idea that there is some way of understanding it, even if it's not clear to us now. Um, it may become clear to us later, but we can know, we can be confident that since sometimes um, that when, when bad things occur, um, that they're part of a God's good and wise plan, that there is some intelligent cause or reason that God included this in his providence. Um, again, I don't say all of this lightly. I understand that it is um, a matter of great seriousness uh, in some circumstances. Um, but we can rest in peace there. And, you know, I think, friends, um, this is something that, that can give us great peace. But I also think it's something that's highly pleasing to the Lord. I think that when we rest in a peaceful confidence in divine providence, despite the pains and evils that we may experience, we are showing God, right? We are demonstrating our piety, demonstrating our trust and faith in God. We are demonstrating to the world, right, that God is so good and so wise that I will endure this pain with peaceful equanimity. That's not a, I'm not trying to espouse here a passionless detachment, although a certain amount of detachment is proper. We may f experience feelings of great sorrow and at the same time, feelings of peaceful resignation in the good and wise plan of our God. So I think that I've found that principle, I, I you know, I've talked about it here just now, and sort of I think it's, it's kind of um, maybe most severe and significant um, instantiation, right? That is when we're going through great disappointments or evils. Um, but it's a principle that I think we can use uh, even just about the daily aggravations as well, right? Um, you know, that, that all of this is part of God's good and wise plan. He's put this person in my life, even if that particular person might be annoying to me, uh, or uh, this particular challenge uh, as part of my professional life, or, um, you know, that my, you know, or that your financial situation, right, isn't exactly as you want, or any of those sorts of things, right? All of that we can accept from God. Now, that doesn't mean that we should simply acquiesce. So, for example, if your financial situation is uh, very poor, right, such that it's very difficult for you to um, uh, provide for your family, well, you know, how would you apply this principle? Well, you'd say, okay, well, this situation is part of God's plan for me. That doesn't mean I should just say, well, okay, I guess I'm going to, you know, I'm never going to be able to provide adequately for my family. No, this is a challenge. This is a circumstance that God has put in your life that he wants you to struggle with this challenge, right? You as a father of a family, if you are, have, of course, the responsibility to make sure for the provision of your family. Remember, the scriptures tell us that a man who does not provide for his own is an infidel, that is an unbeliever. Now, of course, I take that to mean uh, a man who could provide it for his own, but just doesn't do so. Uh, well, you, you know, we should do so, and um, uh, um, and maybe God has put you in a set of circumstances where that's not easy. Well, what God is 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 putting there for you is a path of of challenge, of uh, a path towards fortitude, uh, towards prudence, towards hard work, 
he wants to see in your life, right? So an accepting all from God means not allowing yourself to despair or become frustrated or uh, to think that God doesn't care for you or that God is not in charge. Rather, accepting all from God means accepting um, that this situation comes from God and that's part of his good and wise plan. Therefore, it gives you should give you confidence, right, uh, to not only have a certain sort of peaceful, um, a certain kind of peace in, in, in your soul about the set of circumstances, but also a confidence that, that this is a sort of set, uh, set of circumstances that God has brought into your life for your good, right? And so that even if um, uh, the set of circumstances uh, might be very challenging and in some ways painful, or maybe even embarrassing, right? Um, that this is um, part of God's plan for your good, right? Um, and, and that some good will, in fact, and indeed, uh, be brought from it. Well, so friends, uh, I hope uh, you've uh, found this uh, interesting and, and edifying. Uh, I'm not actually proposing to all of you that, that the five principles that I've found useful are, are the five principles that, that you should always appeal to. Of course, there's much, much more than these five ideas uh, in terms of, um, you know, the resources we should use for guiding our lives. Obviously, you know, we could think about the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We could think about the theological virtues, etc. So, you know, please don't think that I'm um, trying to offer you a, um, a comprehensive set of principles for, for uh, practical life. Uh, these are just principles that I've drawn from the philosophical uh, tradition, particularly the Stoic one, that I found useful. Uh, and I think maybe they're examples of the way in which we can draw uh, principles from philosophy uh, and apply those principles to our daily lives, uh, to the way in which we react to others, to our relationship with others, to our professional lives, uh, etc., so friends, I hope you've uh, found this uh, uh, these comments uh, edifying and useful uh, and enjoyable. I believe that next time we'll be back to our sort of regular standard format. Uh, but until next time, God bless.